Welcome to the Stop COVID Deaths webinar series brought to you by the University of the Philippines. The Stop COVID Deaths shorts make it easier for you to go to the presentations that you are interested in. I'm Dr. Raymond Sarmiento, Director of the National Telehealth Center. And I'm Dr. Susie Pineda Mercado, Adjunct Faculty of the National Telehealth Center. Together, Together let's, let's stop COVID deaths. So the topic assigned to me is COVID-19 vaccines in children. And I would like to thank um, everyone here for inviting me to give this talk. Okay, sorry. Okay. So for my disclosure, um, in relation to this topic, which is on COVID-19 vaccines, I'm a member of the VEP and NAFIC. And so I will be mentioning um, the names of uh, these vaccines, but I am not personally endorsing any of these vaccines. So for this afternoon, um, we will be discussing considerations for the use of the COVID-19 vaccines in children, um, what is the evidence for the safety and efficacy of these vaccines, and what are the current recommendations for the use of these vaccines in children and adolescents. Okay, so let's start. So we do know that children comprise just a small proportion of uh, the, the diagnosed COVID-19 cases. They say two to 3% to less than 10%. However, because we do not do systematic testing of uh, cases, of pediatric cases for, for COVID, and because most of these children may present with mild disease or are actually asymptomatic, we don't actually know the true burden of uh, pediatric uh, COVID um, infections. So as we already mentioned, COVID-19 disease in children is generally mild with an overall good prognosis compared to adults. However, the presence of underlying medical conditions or certain co-infections may actually increase the risk for severe or critical disease in children. So the classification of uh, disease in children, COVID-19 disease in children, is uh, based on severity. And 80% would present with mild to moderate COVID, 2 to 12% would be severe, and about 2 to 10% critical. So 80% moderate to mild, and only about 20% would be severe or critical. So what are these risk factors that increase the severity of COVID-19 in children? So the presence of cardiovascular disease, neurologic conditions, neurodevelopmental disorders, chronic lung disease, immunosuppression, um, cancer or malignancies, genetic endocrine diseases, as well as obesity and prematurity would increase the risk for severe COVID in children. And we also what have what we know as this hyperinflammatory syndrome in children, the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, which resembles Kawasaki uh, disease and, is, act and uh, is actually considered as severe COVID. Okay, so, um, uh, okay, so this, this disease might occur during, so with the COVID um, infection or may present after um, COVID um, infection. Okay, so what are the considerations for use of the COVID-19 vaccines in children and adolescents knowing that background? Okay, so we have a, a certain considerations, starting with the epidemiology or burden, the safety and efficacy or effectiveness of the vaccine, so mathematical modeling relating to population level impact of vaccinating this age group, what are the programmatic implications, um, potential vaccination delivery um, challenges, okay, and acceptance of the vaccination in this age group. So we heard what the person on the street or what the parents were actually saying about, about accepting this um, COVID-19 vaccines for their own children. So let's start with the epidemiology or disease burden of COVID-19. So in countries where the proportion of young in the population is high, over one third of COVID-19 cases occur in children. And most of the cases is, are mild, as we already said, but still a significant number, about 20% of 
will present with severe or even critical disease that will require ICU admission or even result in mortality. And there are some children who experience long COVID symptoms. Increased transmissibility of the Delta variant across all age groups um, results in maybe that's the reason why we are seeing an increasing number of cases in children. And the emergence of new variants may also pose a greater risk if the children and adolescents remain uh, um, susceptible or non-immune. And with older age, the older age groups being increasingly protected by vaccination, a greater proportion of COVID-19 is now anticipated to occur in the younger um, age groups, so the adolescents and children. And the growing number of these unvaccinated children with increase in the numbers added to the birth cohort with, uh, with the deliveries, no? this will result in ongoing transmission. Okay, so this is the latest uh, data that I was able to get as of September 29. I'm sure meron ng September 30, no? But there were 2.5 million cases of COVID-19. And of these positive cases, about 10% would be less than 20 years old. And of that, around 6% would be less than 15. So um, we see that there are uh, children who are being infected. And if we take a look at the population pyramid of the Philippines, which is very similar to what would, we would expect in developing countries, you know, we have a young population. So more of, uh, more of, our pop, or of our people, our population, would be in the younger age groups. So for example, um, in this 2020 um, population pyramid, about 30% would be less than 14 and about 20% would be 15 to 24 years old. So this is in contrast, for example, to industrialized countries where you expect more of the population to be older and even elderly population. So we, we are a young population. And this is important to consider when we talk about herd immunity. So herd immunity can only be achieved if we have a significant proportion of the population who are immune either through vaccination or from getting the infection. And of course, we want to uh, make sure that we achieve herd immunity by increasing vaccination coverage, not by increasing the exposure of our people because that would uh, result in um, unnecessary cases and even deaths. So what we want to do is to increase the vaccination coverage in order to reach herd immunity. Now, the threshold to be able to reach that herd immunity is based on um, a number of factors, including the contagiousness of the virus, which is given here as the basic reproduction number or the R0, as well as the efficacy or effectiveness of the vaccine. So for COVID, for example, for SARS-CoV-2, um, the herd immunity threshold is placed at 60 to 80%. Now, as I mentioned, it will depend, of course, on the efficacy of the vaccine. For example, on the graph on the left, if you have a vaccine efficacy of about 90 to 95% with an R0 or contagiousness of 2.5, which means that for every infected individual, she will now, he or she will now spread it to 2.5 more people. Okay? With that, uh, you will need of uh, vaccination coverage of around 70 to 80 percent. But with lower vaccine efficacy, for example, if the vaccine efficacy is only 62 percent, then take note, you will need to vaccinate almost all of the population. And this includes children. So when you say that you will va vaccinate 80 to 90 percent of the population, does, that does not mean 80 to 90 percent of those who are 60 years old and above, or 80 to 90 percent of the frontliners. No, it means 80 to 90 percent of the entire population, and that will, of course, include children. So, um, this just shows you what how important herd immunity is. And if I may borrow a saying, it uh, mentions that no one is safe unless everyone 
is safe. And that, of course, includes your children and adolescents. So let's move on to the next consideration for introducing vaccines in children. And this should be based on uh, vaccine safety, efficacy, and effectiveness that, uh, that uh, we, we derive from clinical trials as well as effectiveness uh, data from real world vaccination program um, experiences. Okay. And what we know is that there is actually high level evidence with regards to uh, safety, um, strong immunogenicity, and efficacy of the COVID-19 vaccines for adolescents for the two mRNA vaccines. So if in this first study, this is a phase three uh, trial to determine the safety, immunogenicity, and efficacy of the Pfizer um, which is now called the Comirnaty vaccine in adolescents 12 to 15 compared to young adults 16 to 25 years. So in this trial, they enrolled or included more than 2,200 adolescents aged uh, 12 to 15 to uh, receive two doses of uh, the Pfizer vaccine uh, given 21 days apart, and uh, the data would show that uh, it has a favorable safety and side effect profile. Um, if you take a look at the right side in the, uh, on the, on the um, uh, bar graphs here, we show that most of the side effects are mild as, uh, as uh, seen here by the green bars or moderate as seen here by the blue bars. So for the local side effects, the most common would be injection site pain. And for the systemic side effects, the most common would be fatigue, headache, and chills. So these are not uncommon reactions seen with other vaccines. So, so they are not unusual. Okay? And severe reactions occurred, but in fact, they were even lower in the younger age group compared to the young adults. And fortunately, in this trial, there were no vaccine-related serious adverse events and only a few overall severe adverse events seen. Now, what about the antibody titers? So if we take a look at the geometric mean neutralizing antibody titers for the 12 to 15-year age group, it was 1,239. Uh, and this is 1.8 times higher than the 16 to 25 years uh, age group. So it means that it is immunogenic. The vaccine is immunogenic in the 12 to 15 year old age group. And in fact, is even, it even gives rise to higher neutralizing antibodies compared to the young adults 16 to 25 years. For vaccine efficacy um, in preventing COVID-19, symptomatic COVID-19 after two doses, in participants without evidence of previous infection, and even in those who were previously infected, the efficacy is 100%, so with a range of around 75 to 100%. So it's a very good um, efficacy. Now, this second study is a phase two, three clinical trial evaluating the Moderna vaccine. Um, in adolescents 12 to 17 years compared to the young adults 18 to 25 years. So Moderna or the um, Moderna vaccine, yes, is uh, also given as two doses, 28 days apart. And what was shown is that the, the side effects or the adverse events that were seen were also not, um, not unusual. So the most common solicited adverse reactions after both the first and second injections were injection site pain, headache, and fatigue, so similar to the Pfizer vaccine. Um, most of the uh, reactions were seen after the second dose, and most were mild or grade one, again, represented by the green bars, or moderate, represented by the blue bars. Okay. Um, okay. So there were no serious adverse events 
related to the study vaccines, there were a few severe reactions, local and systemic reactions, are represented by the orange bars, but they were very few. Now, with regards to immunogenicity, the geometric mean titers um, in the 12 to 17 year age group compared to the 18 to 25 year age group is not really significantly different, but not inferior. So it is not inferior and it is similar. Um, the, the, the titers in the younger age group, 12 to 17, is not, not inferior to the titers, the antibody titers seen in the 18 to 25 year age group. And for vaccine efficacy against COVID-19, there, there were no cases of COVID-19 seen in those who were given the Moderna vaccine, but there were four cases of COVID-19 uh, seen in the placebo group which gives um, vaccine efficacy of 100%. Now, using a different uh, definition, a more, um, uh, let's say, what do you say, a more not stricter, what's the opposite, easier definition, just respiratory, sim any respiratory symptom um, with a positive test, then the vaccine efficacy is still high. It's still 93%. So again, very good. Okay. Now let's talk about vaccine effectiveness. Uh, there are really no um, published uh, effectiveness studies of the COVID-19 vaccine in adolescents or, or, um, or uh, adolescents or children. And um, vaccine effectiveness can, however, be inferred from the immunogenicity data that we have. So this is called immunobridging analysis. So the effectiveness is inferred from the uh, neutralizing antibodies okay, that is considered to be clinically relevant to infer effectiveness in the pediatric age group. And uh, of course, we do not have yet a specific antibody titer to establish or pred predict protection. But what we want to show is that it is not inferior or better if it is similar or even greater compared to the young adults. And that is what we have demonstrated in the two of the important um, studies regarding the mRNA vaccines. So we consider both the geometric mean titers and the zero response. And we compare uh, the, the uh, response that we see in adolescents versus the young adult populations. And again, as we mentioned, similar or not inferior. Okay. Now there is actually one vaccine effectiveness um, study in children and adolescents, uh, but this is not published yet. This is just uh, presented in this editorial. And uh, what I am presenting now is the interim analysis. So this study was conducted in, is in Israel. As we know, Israel is one of the countries with the most, with the rapid and um, effective, successful vaccine roll out. So they started during the last quarter of last year. And then in January of this year, they already included the 16 to 18 years, uh, a 16 to 18 year old in the priority vaccination group. So they were able to vaccinate um, more than 200,000 uh, as of um, uh, at the time that they did the analysis. And it showed a vaccine effectiveness against symptomatic COVID-19 of 98% and a similar effectiveness against hospitalization in the 16 to 18 year old age group. And there were no cases of severe or critical um, COVID-19 in, in those who were vaccinated, whereas in the unvaccinated uh, group, 15 were hospitalized two in critical condition, and one died. So they had very good um, experience in Israel. Oh, so to maybe summarize what uh, we have seen, the data we have seen in the two studies, as well as the vaccine effectiveness study um, in Israel, the mRNA vaccine, so both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, produced a greater or similar immune response compared to young adults. 
both had a favorable safety profile, and both were highly effective against COVID-19. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about adverse events and side effects, because as we heard from uh, many people, this is actually uh, a, a concern. So as we saw from the clinical trials and even from the real world experience in Israel, um, there were no unusual side effects. Most of the side effects were local or systemic adverse um, effects, and these were mild to moderate. Uh, allergic reactions, uh, mild allergic reactions were seen, but anaphylaxis was rare. And rarer still is the immune-mediated adverse event of immune thrombocytopenia seen in less than one in a million. But what was truly concerning were the reports of myocarditis or pericarditis or myopericarditis in 12.6 per 1 million vaccinated um, individ vaccinees. Okay? So this was a bit concerning because it is greater or higher than the expected rates. So in the United States, they have two um, uh, safe vaccine safety surveillance systems. The first is the Vaccine Adverse Events Report System or the VAERS. Uh, and the other is the VSAFE, sorry, what's the name again? The VSAFE Health Check-In Survey, which is a smartphone-based uh, safety uh, surveillance uh, reporting system. So here, the adolescents who were vaccinated can register and actually directly report whatever um, side effects they are experiencing. And um, we see here that, again, no unusual adverse effects, local and systemic reactions okay, um, were reported, okay, um, especially after those two, but not um, nothing unusual. This is what we usually see with the other vaccines. Now, there were also a, a few who actually um, needed medical care or were hospitalized, very few, but uh, because it is a passive type of reporting, we don't really know what was the cause for the uh, vaccination. So in terms of the V-safe health check in survey involved, involving 129,000 um, uh, ad adolescents age 12 to 17, uh, no safety, um, no safety um, uh, al alarms. However, for the vaccine adverse event reporting system or the VAERS from December to July 16, so although 90% would be non-serious, okay, 10% reported serious adverse events. And uh, here you will notice that myocarditis was actually reported in 40% of the serious or 397 out of a total of 9,246 reports. So that's about 4.3% reported myocarditis. And you will also note that many of the side effects reported were actually related to myocarditis, such as chest pain, increased troponin, um, normal echocardiogram. So these are all um, may, may be related to um, the myocarditis. Okay. Uh, okay. So this is in. in so how, do you, how was the myocarditis diagnosed in uh, patients who received the vaccine? So by echocardiography, what they usually would see would be a reduced or diminished ventricular function or abnormal um, ejection fraction, fraction. And some of the cases would present with mild pleural effusion. This figures, these pictures actually show results from the cardiac um, MRI, cardiac resonance imaging, no, after receiving the vaccine. And what is demonstrated here is enhancement of the subepicardial and mid myocardial sections, um, particularly the inferior and inferolateral uh, uh, ventricle walls. Okay, so this is what you would demonstrate when you do a cardiac 
um, MR for patients with myopericarditis. So what do we know about myocarditis or pericarditis after the mRNA vaccines? So we do know that myocardial injury has been reported in 36% of hospitalized COVID-19 patients. So it's actually part of COVID-19 infection and it can occur even after the patients have recovered from COVID-19. And 36% is higher than what we see in patients, in, in normal people who, are who receive the vaccine. Okay, so myocarditis or myocardial injury occurs um, in a higher percentage of those who are infected compared to those who are vaccinated. Okay, um, so the overall incidence of uh, myocarditis per 1 million doses administered is 12.6 for both mRNA vaccines combined. The incidence um, is seen, uh, is greater in male, adolescents, and young adults, 12 to 29 years, so less than 30 years old, usually seen in the first seven days or within three weeks after the second dose. So the risk is greater in males and after the second dose. How do they present? They present with chest pain, shortness of breath, or palpitations. And uh, how they are diagnosed either by elevated troponin levels or abnormal findings on the ECG, echocardiogram, or cardiac MRI, such as what I showed you earlier. But the good thing is, in those cases of myocarditis that develop after vaccination, 95% of the cases were mild and recovered on their own. It was transient. Uh, lasting only for about two to three days and oh, we're, we're just given minimal treatment with, for example, NSAIDs okay, and dress. Okay? So they were they, um, very mild and transient. Now the CDC, before they recommended um, to include vaccinating um, children, conducted this risk-benefit analysis to compare the benefit of giving the vaccine in terms of preventing COVID-19 cases, COVID-19 hospitalization, ICU admissions, and even deaths, and compare this with the risk of myocarditis. And what we see here is that across the ages, the benefits actually outweigh the risk. However, the benefit and the risk is not balanced across the ages. Why? Because we see um, poorer outcomes of the COVID-19 disease in those who were greater than 30 years old and a greater risk of myocarditis in those who are younger. So if, for example, we take the age group 12 to 17, because that is our focus for this morning, and per... Per, um, per 2 million mRNA vaccine doses administered among the males, we see that there will be 5,700 cases prevented, 215 hospitalizations prevented, 71 ICU admissions, and two deaths prevented. However, there will be 56 to 69 cases of myocarditis that can be reported. Okay, so with this particular data, the CDC um, ACIP advisory group with regards to vaccination concluded that for COVID-19 vaccines, the benefits will still outweigh the risk even for the younger age group, including adolescents. Okay, um, and the risk meaning including uh, myocarditis. Okay. And it is important to monitor the outcome of the myocarditis in those who develop it, develop this after vaccination. So there is continued monitoring of these cases because we do not know what the long-term effect will be. And thirdly, they would like um, this information to be um, disseminated so that people will be aware of what to watch out for after uh, vaccinating. 
But I guess the bottom line is the myocarditis and pericarditis are much more common if you get the disease okay, rather than from the vaccine. And the risk to the heart from the infection can be more severe. Okay. And um, there is another risk-benefit assessment, this time conducted by UK, by the Joint Commission on Vaccination and Immunization. Again, they did this because they also um, were studying whether to recommend the COVID-19 vaccines for adolescents. And here they showed that the uh, benefit of the vaccine um, uh, for the first dose, it will prevent two intensive care admissions and 87 hospital admissions, but may result in three to 17 cases of myocarditis. And they saw that this was more um, acceptable the first dose, but for the second dose, they are a little bit wary because it would prevent 0.16 ICU admissions, six uh, hospitalizations, but will result in a higher number of cases of myocarditis. I guess this is the reason why in their uh, recommendation, they would rather focus on giving the first dose first to all the adolescents before they give the second dose. So what are the benefits of COVID-19 vaccination? It will prevent COVID-19 and its complications. It will reduce transmission in the broader population. And in this specific setting, which is children, adolescents, in the schools, it will prevent uh, transmission. It will mitigate, mitigate the psychosocial impact uh, resulting from disruption in school, sports, other organized activities, socializing, um, because of the isolation uh, uh, of this uh, age group that are key to adolescent physical and mental well-being. And I think that is very important also to consider. So what are the recommendations? I'm, I'm into my last few slides. AAP, as of August 2, 2021, they recommend vaccinating all children and adolescents 12 years of age and older who do not have contraindications. What vaccines do they use? Um, those vaccines that have been approved by the US FDA and recommended by the CDC. And lastly, um, because they want, because of the importance of routine vaccination and rapid uptake of COVID-19 vaccines, then they support co-administration with the other routine and adolescent immunizations. So CDC um, recommends the uh, vaccination for everyone aged 12 years and older to prevent the corona disease 2019. So adolescents aged 12 to 17 are eligible to receive the Pfizer uh, vaccine uh, and they may be vaccinated with appropriate consent and assent. Children younger than 12 years are not eligible to receive Pfizer vaccine at this time. And children and adolescents younger than 18 are not eligible to receive the Moderna or Janssen COVID-19 vaccine at this time. So only Pfizer is recommended or approved for children less than 18, 12 to 17 years old. So what are the countries with an EUA? for this vaccine, for the Pfizer vaccine. You have quite a number, and some of them have actually already um, started vaccinating um, uh, the adolescents. No? Uh, initially, some of them would start with uh, those with underlying medical conditions, but would uh, later on move to universal or routine vaccination of all children 12 to 17 years old. Okay. And we see here that in the Philippines, we already actually have an EUA for Pfizer in as of May, sorry, and May 28, 2021. And for Moderna, um, uh, an FDA EUA uh, in September 2, 2021. So for both, for active immunization for the prevention of COVID-19 in individuals 12 years of age and older. So they had an amendment of their EUA because previously only for 18 and above. 
Okay. So what does the National COVID-19 Vaccination Operation Center um, have to say about this? Okay. So I think there is no argument that um, these vaccines, the mRNA vaccines, are effective and safe for children. Uh, the Department of Health, all experts group reiterates their initial recommendation that vaccination of children and adolescents, even those with comorbidities, shall only begin once the supply of vaccines is adequate and stable. So I think there is no issue about the efficacy, safety. It's more on supply. And this is reiterated by the PPS and PIDSP, who recommend that the priority um, should still be the older and more vulnerable adult age group. Um, and once we have a sufficient percentage um, of these priority adult groups that have been vaccinated, then we can start vaccinating children 12 years um, old and above. Okay? And priority is given to those in areas with high transmission and those with comorbidities. And the fear then was that if you give pediatric vaccination at a time when we still did not have sufficient numbers of uh, our adult priority adult groups vaccinated or insufficient vaccine supply, then this may disenfranchise the limited supply of vaccines to the more vulner vulnerable groups, such as the senior citizens and adults with comorbidities. And so, in view of that, as of August 11, we were not yet vaccinating uh, children 17 years old and below. However, <laughs> two days ago, two days ago, Bayan, three days ago, uh, President Duterte already announced that immunocompromised children 12 to 17 will be vaccinated. And this vaccination will start in October. So the, the Department of Health announced that adolescents with comorbidities will be added to the A3 priority sector and they will be given Pfizer and Moderna or Moderna COVID-19 vaccine. So we, uh, the government is aiming to start October 15 because the capital region in Manila, because the, the, the Manila already has uh, an impressive vaccination coverage. And uh, I think we, we have been assured that by October, we will have enough um, supplies. And then after Manila, then they could expand to other regions after the first two weeks of the pilot implementation. Now, there are other vaccines, COVID-19 vaccines that have been, that are being studied. So Novavax, Janssen, AstraZeneca, and the Pfizer and Moderna have ongoing studies in infants as young as six months. Sinovac also has actually um, a study on children three to 17 years old. They have actually published a paper, which is a phase one, um, two clinical trial, and which um, concluded because this is the first report of an inactivated vaccine, the CoronaVac, being tested in children and adolescents three to 17 years old, and because it is just a phase one, two clinical trial, which is mostly safety and immunogenicity, they found that it was um, relatively safe and immunogenic in this age group. So we look forward to their later phase three trials that can be uh, published soon. So the ongoing challenges in the COVID-19 vaccination of children, and ad of children and adolescents is again because of the constraints on vaccine supply. So that is a key determinant. Okay. And when we start vaccinating children and adolescents, we have to augment the existing infrastructure for vaccination. Okay. So we need to make sure that there are care providers that are experienced in dealing with children and adolescents who are being vaccinated. And of course, logical, logistical concerns because we know that the Pfizer vaccine needs um, ultra low uh, freezer storage requirements. So that might be uh, an issue. Okay? And um, data on vaccine safety is ongoing. We are still 
um, following up these children who develop adverse events and uh, we are uh, monitoring, continuously monitoring um, the long-term effects of uh, the vaccine in, uh, in uh, children and adolescents. So in summary, children and adolescents represent a growing proportion of new COVID-19 cases. Children and adolescents can experience serious outcomes from infection and can transmit the virus. COVID-19 mRNA vaccines have been shown to be safe, um, effective, immunogenic in preventing COVID-19 um, and vaccinating children against COVID-19 will be essential to protect their health and to establish higher population immunity. So that's the end of my slide. Thank you very much for um, listening. We hope that you learned as much as we did from that excellent presentation. We also hope that you will join us every Friday from 12 noon to 2 p.m. Manila time on Zoom, Facebook, or YouTube. So stay safe, stay connected, and, and see you online. online.